Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. Well, today we've got a Commodore 1581 on the bench here. That is the three and a half inch floppy drive that was made for the Commodore 64 and C128. It came with its power supply. It even had a little head protect thing in here. It's a little bit dirty. Yeah, I've actually had this probably a year and a half and I just haven't got around to it yet and I had a question about these recently so I thought well this would be a good time to, to go through it and refurb it so let's jump right in thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video they do circuit boards of all sizes small circuit boards medium circuit boards they can even assemble them for you are you a maker who likes sharing your ideas with other makers if so you can submit your articles to the monthly submission for PCBWA and earn coupons and notary titles. Check out the link in the description below. Now our 1581 itself is in pretty good shape. It is a little dirty. It's got a few scratches. It's slightly yellowed, so maybe we'll do some retro writing on this. Uh, the feet have turned into something that resembles a melted miniature marshmallow. I'm not sure what happened there, but altogether it's in pretty decent shape. It came with the power supply, which also seems to be in good shape. This black cable here I have set up so we can load test it, which is I think what we'll do next. Uh, before wanting to power up any of this old equipment, I always like making sure the power supply is okay. And to do that, you need to load test it. In other words, you need to have a load on it to make sure that the voltage is actually stable. If you measure it just not connected to anything, you don't get the whole picture. Let's look at that really quick. Here we've got our little test setup. We've got our power supply. It's plugged into the wall. We've got our load tester here, which is turned off. There's no load. And we can see the open circuit voltage of the power supply on the 5 volt rail is about 5 and a quarter volts. And I am on the, the DC scale here, of course, because this is a DC output. And if I turn on about half an amp load, you can see the voltage drops a little bit. We've got all this cable here and some voltage drop across the cable. Uh, but everything looks good. Uh, this power supply is rated for one amp. I'm loading it about with, uh, halfway with half an amp and everything's fine. Uh, another test we can do is to see if there's excess ripple on the output. So I'm going to turn the meter from the DC scale to AC. And unloaded, you see it's not really measuring a lot of ripple. And if we turn the load on, we get about the same thing. Um, I also tried this on a slightly more precise meter and it was getting, you know, a few tenths of a millivolt ripple. If you start seeing tenths of a millivolt, uh, or excuse me, if you start seeing tenths of a volt ripple, you know, 100, 200 millivolts, there is a problem with, uh, especially with a uh, linear power supply, like on the C64, the caps on those dry out. They won't provide any filtering and you'll get a lot of ripple. With a switch type power supply, there's always a little ripple, but it's going to be, you know, like 30 millivolts or something like that. It's pretty low. But here, this power supply is in good shape. So when we get to the point of powering up this uh, 1581, we won't have any problems. Now, let's start taking that 1581 apart and see what we find. Okay, let's see about taking this guy apart. Pop out the head protector and rotate him around. I only see a couple of screws here. I don't know if there's anything under our melted marshmallows here or not. Let's start with the ones we can see and then worry about the marshmallows. That sounds like a plan. Okay. These screws are the same size. And there we go. Yep. Okay. Let's 
I'm just tipping up the top like that. That looks to be in good shape. Got our front, which kind of lifts up like that and slips off. And our LEDs here are hardwired to the circuit board. But luckily there is a screw right there. So we can back that guy out. And to keep track of this screw, I will stick it back in the same hole. Yep, that all looks in good shape. Some cobwebs in there. A little yellowed on the front. It's still got the little peely dealy on there. All right, and inside I find uh, RF shield in here, a board at the bottom, and this is an Amiga type three and a half inch drive. Evidently, they used the same drive they did in the early Amigas. And at one point they were running low, so they were stripping the drives out of the 1581s uh, to put in Amigas, and you could get a good deal on a 1581 case in electronics, sans drive. So this looks like that. We've got four screws here to pull the drive out. If you haven't guessed so far, I've never had one of these apart. This is the first 1581 I have ever owned. I've not even used this one yet. So many projects and so little time. There we go. It looks like all four of these screws are the same. That's convenient. Ah, I dropped the screw. There we go. Okay. Yep, all four of those screws are the same. So... This whole shield comes off like this now. And we can do the power connector there. And I want to get a look at the red stripe on our ribbon cable is toward the right. A lot of times these cables do not have a polarized plug. And it's very easy to get them wrong. In fact, I didn't look at this one. So I'll have to go back and review the video. I think it was like that. So where the brown is to the right and the red is to the left. So it pays to look at that before you go pulling it apart. Try to get the cable worked off of there. There we go. Got the drive disconnected from the board. And we've got a loose sticker. Oh, hey, look at that. This actually has Jiffy DOS in this. That was a bonus. 6.02 from 1989. These capacitors look fine. I wouldn't expect them to be bad. And everything else on the board looks perfectly fine. There's a little bit of grass or something right there. That's kind of odd. Okay, well, I think since I want to wash this case, we'll go ahead and take the board out of here. Um, there's one, two, three, four screws, and I think the RF shield and circuit board will come right out. There is a service manual available for this online, which has an exploded parts diagram, and it's got a lot of information about the theory of operation. Um, doesn't have a lot of mechanical information but given that this is a three and a half inch drive the same as what was used in the Amigas uh, there's a lot of information about those out there in fact um, a great resource for working on Amiga drives is Gadget UK's channel he has fixed scores of them I think and figured out how to align them and the whole nine yards does a great job so I'll, I'll put a link to his channel with a search to Amiga drives yeah, that sticker is falling off there again 
Okay, how does that come out of there? Like it. You just gotta hold your mouth just right. Yep. Artwork number 252327. So on this board, we have the Western Digital floppy drive controller. This is just glue logic. The APROM for Jiffy DOS or would be the standard Commodore ROM. Some RAM, uh, 6502 and an 8520A, a CIA chip, and I've got some timer and stuff down here, or crystal oscillator. So not much to this really, a lot simpler board than what was with the 1541. And that's because a lot of stuff is built into the drive electronics itself. I don't want to lose the sticker. I got some thin double-sided tape. I'll stick that back down there with. And then, okay, there's no more screws under there. It's just an insulating sheet. So this just seems to lift out of here carefully. It's got to talk nice to it. There, we've got that out of there. All right, so now we've got both halves of our case separated. Have to figure out how to get these sticky feet off of here. Maybe just a tiny bit of heat will do the job there. I'm not sure. I'll give that a whirl. This is like a 350 watt heat gun so I'm not going to get this really hot just enough to encourage the adhesive to soften up I to keep touching that to make sure I'm not overheating it definitely don't want to use like a reflow iron type of thing. Okay. Yep, that did the trick. That got that that foot off of there. It's just smooshed down over the ears. I've got some white feet that I ordered um, quite a while ago. They didn't fit the application I ordered them for, but they might fit here even though they're obnoxiously white. I think they will do the trick and they'll be better than the marshmallow feet. So I'll go ahead and get the feet off of here and then we'll set the case aside and we'll look at the drive itself. Okay, now that we got our marshmallow feet off of the bottom of the case, let's turn our attention to this drive mechanism. It is mounted to this metal plate with four screws, just like a PC drive would be. And if we look at how the cables are oriented on the back, we notice that the reds are together in the center, whereas they seem to be opposite of each other. Oops, bumped the camera. They seem to be opposite of each other on the PCB end. Oh my goodness, those are tight. Time to get bigger tools. There we go. Gosh. Man, somebody ate their Wheaties that day. These tend to be the front screws here. Got an extra screw hole there, maybe for a different type of mechanism. Today seems to be bump the camera day. Okay, all four of those screws are the same. And uh, yeah, see our ribbon cable here has a twist in it, so it lines up right on both ends. Set the metal aside. We've got the drive mechanism. I'm going to go ahead and 
pull these cables off. Yep, it's not polarized. I don't understand what. Oh my gosh, that one's hard to get off it. There we go. Yeah, that one is polarized though. It's got a little foot there, so you can't plug it in upside down. Okay, let's get into the mechanism. There's just one screw. Luckily, King Kong did not tighten that one. It's just a little bitty guy. And it's got little bumps here. Lift up there. Oh, that's weird. There's like some oil right there. Yeah, on both, I don't know if you can see that, yeah, right there, on both sides. Huh. Well, I don't know that this has been a part before, so I guess that would be from the factory. It looks like all our paint lock screws are still paint locked. It is nice and clean. That's good. Not a lot of dust bunnies. Our button's intact. This is a common failure on these drives is to have that button break. I think somebody made a 3D printable button though. Let's see, this is a Neutronics drive. It's a direct drive. There's no belts. This is the motor for the head. So like all these other three and a half inch drives. There's a shaft here that the head slides on. And when you put a disc in, this top head drops down and everything kind of moves down toward the bottom head. You've got a spring here holding pressure on the head. It's kind of interesting that this bracket is at an angle, but that looks to be how it's designed. Huh. I wouldn't have guessed that. Okay. So a little bit of cleanup here. There is another bit of a metal rail in there too. We would need to get... We really need to get this top plastic piece here out to get to that properly. So I'll have to have a look at that and I'm not sure how that comes out. There's a couple of springs here that hold down on it. And then it may just slip out, but it's got to slip around the head here. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is something about disc and the sensors here. So there are two types of three and a half inch floppies. Uh, you've got your 800k floppy and the 1.44 megabyte floppy. Uh, the 1.44 has a high density label on it and you'll notice that it has two holes here. It's got one hole to say hey I'm a high density floppy and the other is the write enable hole. You don't want to use the high density on these types of drives that are made for the low density disk. They might seem to work right at first, but they will quickly fail or eventually fail. The, the media is different and this head isn't powerful enough to properly magnetize that media. So you can get these new on eBay for uh, not very expensive, so not a big deal. So our write enable notches here. That's different than a five and a quarter inch disc where you put the sticker over there to write protect it. On this, when this hole is open, it's write protected. When you do that, it's write enabled. It's backwards to the five and a quarter inch disc. Why did they do it backwards? I don't know. The sensor for that is right here. It's these two little pegs. You slide the disc in and it's going to press one or the others of those. And 
that is common fault on these drives as that sensor gets dirty you can see it comes down to here and just a drop or two of contact cleaner like some deoxit drop that in there work that up and down several times that normally takes care of it uh, i wouldn't suggest taking your spray can and squirting in there because you're going to get that crap everywhere and just one or two drops will do the trick okay i'm going to uh, look at this off camera to figure out how to pull this plastic piece out so we can get into the mechanics to clean and lubricate it properly and then we'll come back okay that was not too difficult to figure out what i did is i carefully slid the head all the way to the back and i think if we just lift this spring off its perch this is what puts the pressure down on the top head just like that actually we can go ahead and slide him off there he's just on a little spike that sticks out there and then there is a spring on each side here this is called a spring hook by the way it's got a pushy side and a pulley side and as the name implies, it's the perfect tool for working with springs. I've had this one here probably 30 years. Okay. Now, I think if I gently lift up on that head and then lift up this plastic plate, we can carefully slide him out of there like that. That wasn't too tough. And I'm just going to let the heads gently touch each other like that. Here's the bottom of that piece. Not much to it. It's pretty clean. And this is the mechanism that locks into the disc and spins it. It's connected to the motor. Got your top and bottom head here. And we've got two shafts. Now these actually, the lubrication doesn't look too bad on these and they're not too dirty, but I've got it apart. So I'm going to go ahead and clean it and it's a little dusty like right in there. So we'll go ahead and get all that cleaned up too. Okay, I've got just a little rag here that's very slightly dampened with some alcohol. Just go over this and pick up the dust that's accumulated in there over the years. This really is not too bad at all. Just like that. That got most of it. And then with a Q-tip, this Q-tip's actually dry. I don't want to leak alcohol down in here. Just try to get the dust out of there. Well, there's a few electrolytic capacitors in here. But I don't see any signs of leakage, no bulging. There's none on the back, so we're going to leave those alone. Now, some drives will have a history of some of these being bad. But if it's not broke, don't fix it. No. And you don't have to replace all the caps just because. Okay, I'm going to swab up. The old grease. Don't want to get this near the head. I'm gently going to push the head forward or the heads forward. There we go. Okay. Got all that old grease off there. Okay. I've got a little white lithium grease on a Q-tip here. Just a teeny tiny amount. You don't need a lot. And just get that in the places where the head is sliding down. Just gently slide the head back and forth a few times. If you've got a big mound of extra grease somewhere, wipe that up. We don't want it. 
flying around everywhere and the thing's operating. There we go. Okay, that wasn't too hard, was it? Well, you notice when I'm moving the head, you've got this little flag here that's rotating. It's going into this sensor. This is going to be our home sensor. And it is paint locked. And that hasn't been messed with. If this gets banged around or something, perhaps you'd need to adjust it. Some drives, instead of this big stepper motor on the bottom, they've got a little stepper motor on the back here that you can rotate slightly. That type of thing. But I think we'll just leave this one alone. Now, to clean the heads, I'm going to slide these back like that. Just dampen a Q-tip with alcohol. I'll lift that top head like that so I can get the Q-tip in there and gently wipe the top and bottom heads at the same time. Or both, I mean, not at the same time. You don't have to do them. There we go. Okay, I've got the heads cleaned. Now, that's about all we need to do to the mechanism as far as preventative maintenance, other than putting a few drops of contact cleaner in our switch there. Now, I've soaked this Q-tip in some uh, deoxid. And I'm just putting that down over that switch and running it back and forth. And you can't see it running out of the Q-tip, but I can. So I'm just going to do that for 30 seconds or so to try to work some of the deoxid down into those holes, get into the switch, and then we'll put it back together. And I will just mop up any excess that's leaked off of there, wipe off the top, and we are good. Just checking this black plate here. Make sure there's no dust bennies or anything stuck to it anywhere. This looks really good. No worries. Uh oh. Ah, okay. I was going to say a part just fell off. These little white rollers slip right off there, so be careful. So you don't lose those guys. Now, if we do this the opposite way that I took it off there, I'm looking here at this little arm. You see this guy? He's spring-loaded. It looks like it goes down on top of this guy. Um, oh, no, that's something. That, this is something that the disc presses on. So it's not directly related to that guy, I think. At any rate, we took this out with the head all the way back, so we should be able to put it back in the same way. I'm gently, gently, gently lifting up on the head and sneaking this plate underneath it. And my little white roller fell off of this corner. You don't want to lift that head up any more than you have to. There we go. Okay, we've got him in there. Pop the springs back on. Maybe I'll do this, this one the opposite way. Yeah, now you can see that this little arm that rotates when you push the disc in just goes around this knob that sticks up there. Okay, so if we stick a disc in here, see the shutter opens up, the head pops down. All of that looks copacetic. Okay, very good. I'm going to install, oops, you know, one thing we forgot, or I forgot, 
See, so yeah, I keep blaming you guys, and it's all me. We need the head pressure spring. That would have been a disaster leaving that off of there. So he slips on there like this. And like that. No worries. Now we'll try the disc test again. So some common problems when putting these mechanisms together is getting these little wings on the head that go on this plastic plate. If you get these on the wrong side, you'll push the head down and you push the heads together. Um, this has to be free to move, so it's just kind of floating on top of the disc. If that's in the wrong place, you can get some squealing and whatnot. This has had a lot of dirt in it. You might get squealing from just the spindle motor. Anyhow, I think we've got this ready to go now. I'm going to put the sheet metal back together, and then we'll start on the case cleanup. Here is the super fancy RetroBrite setup. I have a couple of seedling heat mats and a plastic box with a cardboard box over that to keep it insulated. Let's have a look inside. Just got a plastic tub here. You can see we've got all our stuff inside. I give it a good wash first. I even included the little push button to eject, uh, eject the disc. And this is about a 4% solution of hydrogen peroxide. Um, I started out with a 12% solution, but I had to add uh, two parts water to that to get enough depth. That's all the hydrogen peroxide I had. I've got two 20 watt or 21 watt heat mats here. And I've got the temperature controller set to 38 degrees Celsius. It started out about 18.5 C. It's only up to 18.7 now. It's been sitting here uh, 15, 20 minutes. So, you know, with only 40 watts of heating power, this takes a while to heat up, especially in the cool basement, which is why I like to uh, keep it enclosed setting on cardboard just to try to insulate it a little bit and this will take you know a day or so like this but it's controllable it's repeatable and it doesn't depend on it being sunny outside while waiting for the retro bright process to work its magic on the drive case I thought I would clean up the power supply and I hadn't intended to take it apart uh, I was trying to clean up the cord and it looked like somebody had spilled soda on it. It was really kind of a bear. There was a little bit in the slots here. And then I noticed that this whole side of the case was already split open. And it didn't take a whole lot of extra effort to go ahead and pop the whole thing out of the case. It opened up really nicely. And then I was able to get all that nasty soda out of there. And have a look at it. Yep, this is just a linear supply. Got our transformer here, uh, some capacitors. There's two pairs of diodes. So we've got the, the 5 volt side here, the 12 volt side here, and our cords. Nothing real complicated. I did check the capacitors. They're fine. The regulators are fine, so we don't really need to do anything in here at this time. Uh, this transformer is about... I don't know. It's perhaps a little smaller than the one used in the black C64 uh, brick of death power supply. But uh, the output rating on this thing is only about two thirds of that. So I think they've more properly sized this. It has a nice sized heat sink. So I think this thing will run for many years to come. And if it has a problem in the future, it's easy to repair it. That's a bonus. Now, I think to put this together, I'll use some E6000 glue. Uh, this stays semi-flexible, so it'll be possible to pop the case open again in the future if I would need to repair it. 
but there's really no way to put screws into this thing to, to put it together. So we'll go the glue route. I've actually had this case cleaned up for a couple days now, so I'm sure it's nice and dry. And I'm just going to lift this whole thing up. I need to support the transformer here underneath because it's not actually connected to the, the heat sink. And we'll pop him into place there. There's a couple little plastic spacers slash insulator sheets that go between the, the aluminum extrusion heat sink and the transformer. Okay. That's in there properly. Everything looks good. And the input cord goes there. Output cord goes there. It's got nice strain reliefs. And we'll just glue it together now. So I think I'm going to put the glue on this half. The other nice thing about this glue is you can get it in different colors. This is clear. And if I get a little messy, I can wait till it starts to set up and peel off the excess. a little near the strain reliefs okay and this goes like this this part is toward the power or toward the transformer yeah i got a little messy there okay was a better choice putting that on the bottom half. If I'd put it on the top half, that would have made a mess. So I'm going to finish cleaning up my glue mess here. I'll wrap some masking tape around it just to clamp it while it's setting up overnight. And then we'll get our uh, covers and get everything put back together. Well, we've got our case retrobrided, the drive cleaned up, so it's time to put all this back together. I left the lid off the drive so we can watch it operate. So let's go ahead and get this put back together enough where we can see it go. So now, grab us a few screws here. Fortunately, all of the screws that go into plastic are the same length, so we didn't have to keep them separated. Okay, now I was puzzling over these cables here. Remember when I took it apart, I pulled the power connector here before noting which way the red stripe was. Generally, the red stripe on a cable is going to point toward pin 1, but not always, so you got to watch. Um, and I noticed it did that on the power connector here. Pin 1 at both ends had the red stripe on it. But the red stripe was at pin 34 on the data connector here. And I realized that the reason they did that is because the, this little king deal that sticks up here won't clear the board. So they had to flip the cable the other way. But, you know, we've got... The red toward pin 34, the red toward pin 34. So it all works out. It's just a little different. So the way I remembered it was on the top, the reds are together, and on the bottom, the reds are apart. Got one extra plastic screw here. Got the two screws which go through the top of the case the screw for here to hold this little board on. Okay. No worries. And I already put the little button back on there. It just snaps on. And I think I'll leave this off for now until we get to test it and have a look inside. Which means now we need to get a computer. So I'll be right back. So I thought maybe a good first step was just to power on the drive without it connected to the C64. 
Got our LEDs here where we can see them. Power supply is plugged in. If we turn it on, both LEDs are on for a bit. Uh, the stepper motor makes a little bit of noise and the red LED stays on. According to the manual, if the drive detected an error when it does the self-test, it'll blink the red LED. So this seems to indicate that it's in a good power on condition when not being used and not connected to the C64. So now we'll shut the power off and go ahead and connect it up to the C64 and see if it works. Again. Got the serial cable connected from the drive to the C64. So I'll go ahead and power on the drive. The drive LEDs on the drive responded the same. We'll turn on the C64. That seemed to be okay. The drive made a little buzzing sound. Now what I don't know here is how the drive is going to work. Um, I've got a fast load cartridge in here. I don't know how it works with the 1581 and the 1581 has the Jiffy DOS in it. So we may wind up shutting off the fast load cartridge to get anything to happen. Um, the disk in and everything seemed to be okay so if we type in pound we can get to the menu and then uh, C a copy menu and F for format enter a new title how about Hey, Bert. Enter ID. No, no, 42. Definitely 42. Insert disk. Press space to continue. Okay, the drive is moving. It's spinning. It's stepping. That all seems to be pretty good. And we've got the green and red LEDs on solid. The format makes a pretty good test because it's writing all the timing marks to the disk and checking up on itself. So if we can format a disk, it's probably working okay. Now, since I don't have any uh, commercially made three and a half inch disk for the, this 1581, you know, Commodore made disk, I don't know about the alignment, but Judging by the uh, physical look of this drive, I would say it's probably okay. And space. B to return, B to return to basic. So if we type in a program now, like 10 print. Hey Bert, everybody's favorite program in the world. Okay, we have our little program in here, and if we go and just call it Hey, I think that's the shortcut for save. Yep, saving Hey. And we can do dollar sign, and there is Hey. Ah, I just got dirt on my keyboard. We no longer have our program. If we type in whack and hey, now here's where I think we're having problems. Yep, I think here's where Jiffy DOS and the fast load cart are arguing with each other. Okay. Okay. Do a directory and it's still on there. Now if we do pound and disable fast load. Now if we type in load hey, comma eight, comma one. Comma eight since it's basic. 
That worked. Okay. So with the Jiffy DOS ROM in the drive and the fast load cart on the computer, they're not speaking the same fast load language, so they're not wanting to work together. And there's our program, and it's running again. I know the screen's a little small there, but so basically our drive is working. It's got Jiffy DOS in it, so to use it to the fullest extent, we would need the computer to have Jiffy DOS. Uh, I'm sure we can find the ROM, the standard stock 1581 ROM, and burn another EEPROM to put in here. But I think for now, I'll leave Jiffy DOS in here. And uh, we can format and load and save. Um, so I'm pretty happy this thing's working. Thought we would get some close ups of the drive mechanism in action in case yours is messing up. Here, the head is toward the front, the disc is not locked in. This is kind of floating out here. And I am going to power on the drive so he saw it home itself okay now I'll turn on the computer okay it didn't do anything extra there I've got the right enable on the disk open And we'll try to do a format and see what happens. The LED up here where we can see it. Huh. That seems to be ignoring the right enable notch. So I wonder if that switch is not working. Hmm. So I've been able to format it with the right enable in both positions, which isn't correct. So I'll have to check that switch, or maybe that's a quirk of Jiffy DOS. I do not know. A little handheld shaky cam here. I noticed that if I press this switch and watch the spindle in there and listen real close. It seems to look for that being pressed. And if I just bump it, it'll go off again. So I think if I hold them both down, everything's fine. I think I need to pull this drive mechanism out of this top uh, metal plate here and have a better look at that switch. Well, that was a disaster. I was trying to pull this little plastic cover off of the right enable switch mechanism here because it looks like it's very difficult to get this PCB out and I'm not sure how this is connected to the PCB. I was assuming that these were some pull-up resistors for the contacts and on one of them I kind of had some intermittent contact with ground but it wasn't great. Um, it was very spotty and if I you know, looked at the switch cross-eyed it would go away. So I thought well I can pop that cover off of there and as soon as I got it close to being off it exploded. Parts went everywhere. Uh, one of these little springs wound up, you know, a couple hundred millimeters away on the bench. One wound up on the carpet. These parts wound up inside the drive mechanism, and somehow I managed to find all of them. I think I should go buy a lottery ticket today. Um, it's kind of hard to see down in here, but I'm guessing that the little bits of shiny stuff you see in there are copper contacts, and they have oxidized over time, which is why we weren't getting any connection. I've got some deoxit on this Q-tip here, but it doesn't quite fit in there past those posts. 
So I'm not quite sure the best way to go about this, but what I need to do is get that cleaned out in there. So I will do that and then we'll have a look at it when it's cleaner. Since I had this apart, I made a map of the inside of the switch. This is where the pegs go that go all the way through that the holes on the disc press or don't press. There's a solid pad over here which is ground. There is a single pad here which I labeled A and one here I labeled B. And there are three pull-up resistors here. This one goes to A. This one goes to B. So there are contacts that go from A to ground and B to ground and pull down these signals. So knowing where this is now, it should be easier for other folks to check the switch. So here's the switch. Here's the three pull-up resistors, uh, A and B. And the A contact would be here and the B contact would be here and the ground is over here. I've stuffed some cotton in here from a Q-tip that soaked in deoxid. And I'm just going to let that set there for a while to do its magic. Um, I've wiped down the little contacts just here. You can see on the side. I've wiped these down with deoxid. I can't really get in there and clean that really well. So hopefully by letting it set with deoxid, um, that'll do the trick. And then hopefully we can get this switch reassembled and it'll work. So we'll see what happens. I did eventually get the contacts in here clean. You can see they are nice and shiny now. They're not black like the color of the plastic. To me, this looks like some type of silver plated contacts. Uh, what I wound up having to do was cut off a little slice of some 400 grit sandpaper and just reach it on in here like this, clean it up. I was trying to ohm it out with the meter and I actually broke off this little post on this side so I had to glue it back on. I think that is just there as a spring guide. There's a spring here and here. And this reminded me of years ago. Uh, the company I was working for were having a problem with one piece of equipment with an interlock switch that was on a cover. kept going bad and the company that made it came out with a new switch that had a higher current rating and one of my uh, co-workers said you know i th i th think that was the wrong way to go so we took the switch apart and looked at it and it had uh, silver contacts but the current going through the switch was actually very low and my co-worker explained to me that silver is a wonderful material to use for high current uh, switching applications because it's self-cleaning However, when you don't have enough current running through it, you don't get that self-cleaning action and it'll quickly tarnish. And I think maybe that's what happened here. And it may just be a combination of the length of time and, and whatnot, but that was sure black and it's not now. So what I'm going to try to do is put this back together um, with the little switch pegs in there and the contacts just sitting on top and then we'll ohm out. And see if we're getting a connection before we put it the rest of the way back together. Well, I had to take it apart again and uh, it didn't explode this time. And I used my little pointy curved uh, tweezers here to very carefully scrape those contact areas. They still weren't clean enough and the actual switch leaves were kind of um, like a cross section of a bowl like this and they raised up about, I don't know, half, three quarters of a millimeter. I bent that a little more so they made better contact. I got it popped back together. I smeared just a little E6000 around the edge. And now if we go on our pull-up resistors here, see we have a beep. Got a really solid switching action now. And I think to be doubly sure that that cap doesn't pop off of there, I'll take some cap tan tape and kind of wrap it around here like this or like this. It might be easier to go like this. And that'll just make sure that stays together. And I'll give it a few hours for this E6000 to set up.
before I assemble it. That is an absolutely terrible design for a switch. What a pain in the butt. Um, I can bet some people have bypassed that over the years because it's, it's so terrible. Anyhow, it works now, so we can move forward. We've got everything connected up here. Um, remember, I've still got a fast load cartridge in, but there's Jiffy DOS in the drive. So uh, if when we try to load, we'll have to shut the fast load off first. Anyhow, I've got a formatted disk in here, and the right protection tab is here, so it's covered, so we should be right enabled. And when I put the disk in, I can hear the drive spin up for a second. So it's seeing the disk being ejected and inserted. I'm going to try to save this as hey one which will be the file name uh, with it right enabled. Look at the LED here. I've got the, both the red and green on. The green went right off. But looks like we did okay. If we pull up a directory. We've got hey one there. So we can still save when we have the right enable in the right position. Now I've got the right enable open, so we should be right disabled. And I'll try to save this as hey two. We'll look at the LEDs here. And yeah, the green LED flashed briefly, and now the red's blinking. And if we try to do a directory, yeah, it still showed us a directory. And that cleared the error. So, so our right enable, uh, disable switches are working. Now, I think on the 1581, all those two switches are doing is letting it know if there is a uh, disk in there and if it's right enabled or not. And since those contacts were oxidized so severely, it wasn't making contact. So it was like both switches were pressed all the time. So it didn't really know if there was a disk in there or not, or if it was right enabled or not. It always thought there was a disk in. It always thought it was right enabled. On the Amiga uh, that uses the same drive, it, the, um, you'll have a game or something, let's say insert disc two and you pop the disc out and as soon as you stick the second disc in, it starts going. Well, it's using those two switches there. So it's figuring that when the, the disc is out, both of the switches are gonna be up. When you put the disc in, no matter how that tab is set, the right enable tab, uh, one of the switches is gonna be pushed down so that, that way it can know if there's a disc in there or not. So uh, that's one of the, the failure modes with the Amiga with those switches is it won't automatically see when you've popped a disc in and out. At any rate, on our 1581 here, we've got everything working as it should be working and we need to go ahead and put the clothes back on this guy. One top tip here, it always seems to me that this really shiny plating they put on a lot of the internal stuff on these old computers is really prone to corroding from fingerprints. So I've got a little alcohol in a rag and I'm just gonna wipe my fingerprints off of it. It'll also keep the FBI from investigating you if they find your fingerprints inside the drive. Okay, that's a joke. Might not have been a good joke. But anyhow, I don't know how much that'll really help, but we'll do it anyhow. And got our front cover put on here. Just got the one screw. Sure, our LEDs go down in the slots where they live. There we go. Yeah, not too shabby. Now, if you were just going to pop one of these open to clean the heads, you would just need to take the top cover off. Take this one screw out, then you could lift this cover off and get in there to do the head cleaning. I do believe that would work just fine. And rotate it 
rotate him up like that. You've got to kind of get the button in the hole first. Get the button in the hole first and then rotate it up. And it'll kind of latch on the bottom. Make sure our cable here is out of the way of everything that we don't want it to be stuck on. And we'll slide in the top cover and rotate him down. Just like that. And this only has two screws holding the top cover on. These are both machine screws. Okay, now I've got some of our overly white feet here. Yeah. This is reminding me of like normal tooth color in somebody that goes overboard with the whitening cream. But they are better than the melted marshmallows. And they're the right diameter. So I guess for now these will do. Okay. They look a little silly, but we'll do the trick when it's upside down or right side up. I won't be able to tell. I don't know how well you can tell from the top here. Maybe if I rotate this, there's a few scratches on the top cover, but it's in pretty good shape. I'm not really happy with it. Thanks for joining us as we got our Commodore 1581 drive fixed up. It really was in pretty good shape. It wasn't too dirty. That right enable switch was a real doozy though. Uh, when I tried to take that apart and it exploded and shot parts everywhere, my heart sank. And it is a miracle that I managed to locate all the parts. They were all over the table. There was a spring on the floor. It was a real mess. Or as Gadget UK would say, what a nightmare. Okay, not a great accent, but... Uh, anyhow, I was thinking about that some more, and I don't know if I would try to pop that apart again unless I had no other alternative. Uh, I might try taking some cat tan tape and wrapping around the bottom of the switch with the PCB upside down and filling in that little dam I just made with some contact cleaner. Now, I used deoxit. Maybe there's a better type for that silver-plated contacts that are in there, but... You know, if you were slowly dripping that contact cleaner in there over time and working in the switch over and over, maybe that combination of the chemical action and mechanical action would clean that up. Uh, taking it apart was a real mess. Mm. Don't want to do that again. But we did wind up getting our uh, dry fixed. We had a little fun with the, the confusion between the Epix fast load cart and Jiffy DOS that's in the drive. But we got it all to work out and we got it tested in everything's working fine. If you have any questions or comments, I would love to hear from you. Uh, just leave them in the comment section down there below. And thanks to everyone who helps support the Haybert channel through Patreon and other means. It's greatly appreciated. If you would like to find out some information about that, well, there's some information in the description below. Well, until next time, bye.